This is Chapter Fifty Three of Sketches New and Old. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sketches New and Old by Mark Twain. Chapter Fifty Three: The Facts Concerning the Recent Resignation. Written about 1867. Washington, December 1867. I have resigned. The government appears to go on much the same, but there is a spoke out of its wheel, nevertheless. I was clerk of the Senate Committee on Conchology, and I have thrown up the position. I could see the plainest disposition on the part of the other members of the government to debar me from having any voice in the consuls of the nation, and so I could no longer hold office and retain my self-respect. If I were to detail all the outrages that were heaped upon me during the six days that I was connected with the government in an official capacity, the narrative would fill a volume. They appointed me clerk of that committee on conchology, and then allowed me no amanuensis to play billiards with. I would have borne that, lonesome as it was, if I had met with that courtesy from the other members of the cabinet which was my due. But I did not. Whenever I observed that the head of a department was pursuing a wrong course, I laid down everything and went and tried to set him right, as it was my duty to do and I never was thanked for it in a single instance. I went, with the best intentions in the world, to the Secretary of the Navy, and said, Sir, I cannot see that Admiral Farragut is doing anything but skirmishing around there in Europe, having a sort of picnic. Now, that may be all very well, but it does not exhibit itself to me in that light. If there is no fighting for him to do, let him come home." There is no use in a man having a whole fleet for a pleasure excursion. It is too expensive. Mind, I do not object to pleasure excursions for the naval officers, pleasure excursions that are in reason, pleasure excursions that are economical. Now they might go down the Mississippi on a raft. You ought to have heard him storm. One would have supposed I had committed a crime of some kind, but I didn't mind. I said it was cheap and full of Republican simplicity and perfectly safe. I said that, for a tranquil pleasure excursion, there was nothing equal to a raft. Then the Secretary of the Navy asked me who I was, and when I told him I was connected with the government, he wanted to know in what capacity. I said that, without remarking upon the singularity of such a question, coming as it did from a member of that same government, I would inform him that I was clerk of the Senate Committee on Conchology. Then there was a fine storm. He finished by ordering me to leave the premises, and give my attention strictly to my own business in future. My first impulse was to get him removed. However, that would harm others besides himself, and do me no real good, and so I let him stay. I went next to the Secretary of War, who was not inclined to see me at all until he learned that I was connected with the government. If I had not been on important business, I suppose I could not have got in. I asked him for a light. He was smoking at the time. And then I told him I had no fault to find with his defending the parole stipulations of General Lee and his comrades in arms, but that I could not approve of his method of fighting the Indians on the plains. I said he fought too scattering. He ought to get the Indians more together, get them together in some convenient place, where he could have provisions enough for both parties, and then have a general massacre. I said there was nothing so convincing to an Indian as a general massacre. If he could not approve of the massacre, I said the next surest thing for an Indian was soap and education. Soap and education are not as sudden as a massacre, but they are more deadly in the long run, because a half-massacred Indian may recover but if you educate him and wash him, it is bound to finish him some time or other. It undermines his constitution. It strikes at the foundation of his being. Sir, I said, the time has come when blood-curdling cruelty has become necessary. Inflict soap and a spelling-book on every Indian that ravages the plains, and let them die. The Secretary of War asked me if I was a member of the Cabinet, and I said I was. He inquired what position I held, and I said I was clerk of the Senate Committee on Conchology. I was then ordered under arrest for contempt of court, and restrained of my liberty for the best part of the day. I almost resolved to be silent thenceforward, and let the government get along the best way it could. But duty called, and I obeyed. 
I called on the Secretary of Treasury. He said, "'What will you have?' The question threw me off my guard. I said, "'Rum punch.' He said, "'If you have got any business here, sir, state it, and in as few words as possible.' I then said that I was sorry he had seen fit to change the subject so abruptly, because such conduct was very offensive to me, but under the circumstances I would overlook the matter and come to the point. I now went into an earnest expostulation with him upon the extravagant length of his report. I said it was expensive, unnecessary, and awkwardly constructed. There were no descriptive passages in it, no poetry, no sentiment, no heroes, no plot, no pictures not even woodcuts. Nobody would read it. That was a clear case. I urged him not to ruin his reputation by getting out a thing like that. If he ever hoped to succeed in literature, he must throw more variety into his writings. He must beware of dry detail. I said that the main popularity of the almanac was derived from its poetry and conundrums, and that a few conundrums distributed around through his treasury report would help the sale of it more than all the internal revenue he could put into it. I said these things in the kindest spirit, and yet the Secretary of the Treasury fell into a violent passion. He even said I was an ass. He abused me in the most vindictive manner, and said that if I came there again meddling with his business he would throw me out of the window. I said I would take my hat and go if I could not be treated with the respect due to my office, and I did go. It was just like a new author. They always think they know more than anybody else when they are getting out their first book. Nobody can tell them anything. During the whole time that I was connected with the government it seemed as if I could not do anything in an official capacity without getting myself into trouble. And yet I did nothing, attempted nothing, but what I conceived to be for the good of my country. The sting of my wrongs may have driven me to unjust and harmful conclusions, but it surely seemed to me that the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Treasury, and others of my confreres had conspired from the very beginning to drive me from the administration. I never attended but one cabinet meeting while I was connected with the government. That was sufficient for me. The servant at the White House door did not seem disposed to make way for me until I asked if the other members of the cabinet had arrived. He said they had, and I entered. They were all there, but nobody offered me a seat. They stared at me as if I had been an intruder. The President said, "'Well, sir, who are you?' I handed him my card, and he read, "'The Honorable Mark Twain, Clerk of the Senate Committee on Conchology.' Then he looked at me from head to foot, as if he had never heard of me before. The Secretary of the Treasury said, "'This is the meddlesome ass that came to recommend me to put poetry and conundrums in my report, as if it were an almanac.' The Secretary of War said, "'It is the same visionary that came to me yesterday with a scheme to educate a portion of the Indians to death and massacre the balance.' The Secretary of Navy said, I recognize this youth as the person who has been interfering with my business time and again during the week. He is distressed about Admiral Farragut's using a whole fleet for a pleasure excursion, as he terms it. His proposition about some insane pleasure excursion on a raft is too absurd to repeat. I said, Gentlemen, I perceive here a disposition to throw discredit upon every act of my official career. I perceive also a disposition to debar me from all voice in the councils of the nation. No notice whatever was sent to me today. It was only by the merest chance that I learned that there was going to be a cabinet meeting. But let these things pass. All I wish to know is, is this a cabinet meeting, or is it not? The President said it was. Then, I said, let us proceed to business at once, and not fritter away valuable time in unbecoming fault-findings with each other's official conduct. The Secretary of State now spoke up in his benignant way, and said, Young man, you are laboring under a mistake. The clerks of the Congressional Committees are not members of the Cabinet, neither are the doorkeepers of the Capitol, strange as it may seem. Therefore, much as we could desire your more than human wisdom in our deliberations, we cannot lawfully avail ourselves of it. The councils of the nation must proceed without you. 
if disaster follows as follow full well it may be it balm to your sorrowing spirit that by deed and voice you did what in you lay to avert it you have my blessing farewell these gentle words soothed my troubled breast and i went away but the servants of a nation can know no peace i had hardly reached my den in the capital and disposed my feet on the table like a representative when one of the senators on the conchological committee came in in a passion and said where have you been all day i observed that if that was anybody's affair but my own i had been to a cabinet meeting to a cabinet meeting i would like to know what business you had at a cabinet meeting i said i went there to consult allowing for the sake of argument that he was in any wise concerned in the matter he grew insolent then and ended by saying that he had wanted me for three days past to copy a report on bombshells eggshells clamshells and i don't know what all connected with conchology and nobody had been able to find me this was too much this was the feather that broke the clerical camel's back i said sir do you suppose that i am going to work for six dollars a day if that is the idea let me recommend the senate committee on conchology to hire somebody else i am the slave of no faction take back your degrading commission give me liberty or give me death from that hour i was no longer connected with the government snubbed by the department snubbed by the cabinet snubbed at last by the chairman of a committee i was endeavoring to adorn i yielded to persecution cast far from me the perils and seductions of my great office and forsook my bleeding country in the hour of her peril but i had done the state some service and i sent in my bill the united states of america in account with the honorable clerk of the senate committee on conchology to consultation with secretary of war fifty dollars to consultation with secretary of navy fifty dollars to consultation with secretary of the treasury fifty dollars cabinet consultation no charge to mileage to and from jerusalem via egypt algiers gibraltar and cadiz fourteen thousand miles at twenty cents a mile two thousand eight hundred dollars to salary as clerk of senate committee on conchology six days at six dollars per day thirty six dollars total two thousand nine hundred and eighty six dollars territorial delegates charge mileage both ways although they never go back when they get here once why my mileage is denied me is more than i can understand not an item of this bill has been paid except that trifle of thirty six dollars for clerkship salary the secretary of the treasury pursuing me to the last drew his pen through all the other items and simply marked in the margin not allowed so the dread alternative is embraced at last repudiation has begun the nation is lost i am done with official life for the present let those clerks who are willing to be imposed on remain i know numbers of them in the departments who are never informed when there is to be a cabinet meeting whose advice is never asked about war or finance or commerce by the heads of the nation any more than if they were not connected with the government and who actually stay in their offices day after day and work they know their importance to the nation and they unconsciously show it in their bearing and the way they order their sustenance at the restaurant but they work i know one who has to paste all sorts of little scraps from the newspapers into a scrapbook sometimes as many as eight or ten scraps a day he doesn't do it well but he does it as well as he can it is very fatiguing it is exhausting to the intellect yet he only gets eighteen hundred dollars a year with a brain like his that young man could amass thousands and thousands of dollars in some other pursuit if he chose to do it but no his heart is with his country and he will serve her as long as she has got a scrapbook left and i know clerks that don't know how to write very well but such knowledge as they possess they nobly lay at the feet of their country and toil on and suffer for twenty five hundred dollars a year what they write has to be written over again by other clerks sometimes but when a man has done his best for his country should his country complain then there are clerks that have no clerkships and are waiting and waiting 
and waiting for a vacancy, waiting patiently for a chance to help their country out, and while they are waiting, they only get barely two thousand dollars a year for it. It is sad, it is very, very sad, when a member of Congress has a friend who is gifted, but has no employment wherein his great powers may be brought to bear, he confers him upon his country, and gives him a clerkship in a department, and there that man has to slave his life out, fighting documents for the benefit of a nation that never thinks of him, never sympathizes with him, and all for two thousand or three thousand dollars a year. When I shall have completed my list of all the clerks in the several departments, with my statement of what they have to do, and what they get for it, you will see that there are not half enough clerks, and that what there are do not get half enough pay. End of chapter 53